Howdy, y'all, and welcome to the Ears Podcast, produced by Terrier TV. I am one of several alligator robs, or maybe I'm only one. I'm not quite sure. I was joking about You're that last time. Having an identity crisis. Well, I was joking last time. I say always say the 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 I'm um, the one alligator rob when I'm maybe I'm maybe there's more than one of me. I don't know. <laughs> It's possible there could be different alligator robs. I don't think the I don't think the world could handle that. Yeah, I would say I wouldn't really want to wish that anybody. But anyhow, how are you doing there, Bill? Everything going okay? And the I am opposite good. universe? Yeah, I am uh, in the uh, control room um, because uh, students were not available today. So they have been testing, huh? What was yes. so? What was the test they took today? The PSAT was the test. Oh. What does that actually mean? Um, well, it's kind of the practice uh, SAT. So oh. you take it when you're in 10th grade to prepare you to take the SAT when you're in 11th grade. Do so. you do you either one of you guys watch Shark Tank? Yes. No. Yeah, so there was a, a <laughs> there was a guy on there not too long ago. I, I so I've been going through since some from season 1 all the way to like season 13 wherever they're at now and watching every single one of them. There was a guy in like season 7 or something who made a perfect SAT score and like what well, I think what is it 2400 something along those lines. Um, I think, I think it's, it's, I think it's big. Yeah. I think it's 1800. Is it? Okay. Yeah, well, he, he had done that and then he started a company called, you know, something about SAT prep scoring. And I didn't realize there was that much money in, uh, SAT testing. Oh yeah. Kaplan, uh, is a big company and they make a lot of money doing test prep. Yep. Interesting. Very interesting. Cindy, how are you? I'm good. Yeah. No more crazy birds of the house. No, okay. no, I'm, I'm. I haven't asked about it in a long time, so I figured it was worth asking. The statue worked. I haven't seen it back since. We've never talked about giant birds ever again in the studio I've, since that day. So <laughs> I didn't. Right. I, I just, have. I have more fish in the pond now. Really, and they're I, safe. I was scared for a while. I wasn't going to add any. How yep, did the pond safe. survive the hurricane? Did it like overflow? Were fish like running around in the living room? They, they weren't in the living room, but they were. Uh, they were all over in the backyard. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was. There was some wrangling that had to happen. Fish wrangling. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. That sounds like Justin's right, Justin's alley. <laughs> no, it all fell on me. He Did was it at really? work. He had you in the backyard fi- uh, fish wrangling. He's a firefighter. He was at work. Okay, so major questions about the situation. <laughs> One, were you wearing boots or were you barefoot? I was barefoot. Okay, Come respect. on, I'm not new here. I was barefoot. Respect. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to imagine that, Bill. What do, you, what do you think? It sounds pretty hilarious. Oh, yeah. No, I got a big <laughs> picture of her splashing around in the backyard, kind of Winnie the Pooh style. <laughs> <laughs> yes. were, you, were you carrying a basket? Were you carrying a basket up with a fish in? That's a major question, too. No. Or were you just like double hand and double fist and fish? I was just shooing them. With, oh, you were with shooing my hands. them? Yes. Okay. See, I'm I, thinking about you running around the backyard barefoot. I didn't prepare for this. I just. With, with a fish in each hand so you, going. You didn't have your fish no, basket? I couldn't have them in each hand because I had to have my glass of wine in one hand, Frank. <laughs> okay, so there was wine involved, too, on top of everything else. There, it was a hurricane. Why was there no video of any of this? I can't go through a hurricane without wine. Why don't Come you on. invite your okay. friends over for situations like this? So, hold on a second. I want you to... A friend I, of mine... I don't see why this is such a... <laughs> it's hilarious. A friend of mine was telling me, what are the... When, when people prepare for a hurricane, what are the two items, the two most common items that fly off the shelf? Alcohol? Toilet paper and water. No. Alcohol? Well, you are right. <laughs> Alcohol. So, that's beer. What's the second one? That's toilet paper or water, right? Nope. Bread. No. You know what it is? And, and I went to Walmart yesterday, and they still don't have them back stocked up. Pop-Tarts. What? Pop-Tarts. Oh Pop-Tarts. Pop-Tarts. People buy beer wow. and Pop-Tarts. I'm a failure. I didn't have a single Pop-Tart. You didn't have any pop <laughs> Well, <laughs> that you is couldn't very strange. find them because I tell you what, they're There's off that. the shelf. Pop-Tarts. There, there are none. Pop-Tarts, yep. I couldn't tell you last time I had a Pop-Tart. <laughs> I mean, I know I've had them before, cooked and uncooked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, you, there's no real wrong way to have it. You put them in the, in the uh, toaster. Oh, yeah. You toast them. Or yes, you, you do. The you freezer. don't eat them uncooked. You put them no, in the freezer? No, no, no. You put them in the freezer. What? Oh, you haven't tried it. What Make that face. What insanity is Make that? Make that face. But I'm telling you, try it. Put one in the freezer and try it. You'll never eat it any other way. In the freezer. In the freezer. Yep. Do, wait, wait, wait. Do you, so, do you, you toast it, then you freeze no, it, or you just no, freeze no, no. it? No, no, no. Just frozen Pop Tart. You, you leave it in that weird little ceramic. Yep, leave it ceramic in the foil thing. And foil, yeah. Throw it in the freezer. Why did I say ceramic? And, and then uh, eat it frozen. Oh, it, eat it frozen. You eat it. Oh, why? yes. Why? Oh, yeah. Is there a specific flavor that comes to mind when you think about this situation, Bill? Well, yeah, the s'mores one. The s'mores oh. one, frozen. Hmm. Oh, it's so good. Okay. It's so good. 
You, you <laughs> make that face, but I'm telling you, you got to try it. Uh, okay. th- did you see the picture that I tagged you in earlier this week of a very, very young Bill? Yes. That Can was, we talk about that for please, a minute? Please, let's talk about it. Yeah, that was uh, from 1999. That was 1999, Bill. Was that oh. one you took? That was, uh, yeah, I was, that's the year I graduated. Oh, did you yep. wow. Did you send me that picture a while ago? I did. Okay. I sent it to you last year this time. Here's, here's the story. I looked at that picture, and I sent it to my son, and I said, I'm about the same age you are right now in this picture, Yeah. and I look just like him. He you know, now you like say me. it. Now you say it. You're right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was like, "Oh, this is so scary." <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, I saw. I saw you guys at the game on Friday. Yep. I saw you all walking by, and if it wasn't in the middle of the game, I would have 100 uh, percent yell at you all on the loudspeaker and harassed you guys. But uh-huh. it just seemed kind of inappropriate when I was already calling the wrong kid's name the entire time. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. There was. I guess there was a. There was. <laughs> there was a change between jerseys. And I thought it was strange that number 17 was playing quarterback when number six always played quarterback, Josiah Allen. Right. And I'm like, well, Daryl Bacon's playing quarterback. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, that's it. That's, I hadn't seen that before in the games I've called. So, you know, I'm like, Daryl Bacon is running all over the place. Like, <laughs> Bacon's going off. He's like, he's, there's Bacon going everywhere. Bacon's going left. Bacon's going right. Bacon's going to the center. Bacon's throwing touchdowns. I'm like, look at Bacon go. He's going, he's going everywhere. Yeah. And I'm like, Touchdown, Daryl Bacon! Touchdown, Daryl Bacon! <laughs> and a, com- a complete pass, Daryl Bacon! And then I get a text uh, from uh, literally four people at the same time. Uh, Daryl Bacon and Josiah Allen changed jerseys? That is oh. Josiah Allen. I'm like, it's th- this, this ship has already went to <laughs> halftime now. It yeah, it's already went to halftime now. Daryl oh, Bacon's yeah. having a game, buddy. That's right. I'm like, <laughs> That's right. Game of his lifetime. Game of his lifetime. Good Lord. Oh, I was, I was busted up in the, in the booth. Because you the, the text I got from you was like the fourth one in a row. In the same like 30 seconds, I'm going, huh, not Daryl Bacon. I was just, not Daryl Bacon. I was just forwarding oh, it's what not they Darryl said Bacon. to me. Because yeah. they knew that I knew you. Yeah. It was like, would you tell the guy in the booth that it's not Daryl Bacon? <laughs> it, it was the same time that... Uh, uh, <laughs> oh my garage i got a i got a call on the radio at the same time hey just so you know frank that is uh from jason that is not daryl bacon like <laughs> yeah. i'm getting i got that jason copy that copy, copy that copy that roger that all right so <laughs> good oh grief we went down a we went down a hole on that one okay so uh you guys ready to get into our guest today i'm ready <laughs> oh lord so today on the podcast we are joined by a lady that has been a friend of uh, myself and my family's for many many moons uh miss martha Passario. martha thank you so much for joining us well welcome it's really a pleasure to be here so tell us a, a little bit about you miss martha where you're from uh what you did for a career um and what you're up to these days well i'm a new england transplant having come down here after the bicentennial and i was a frequent visitor to see my folks who had moved here at the end of the apollo era and i was so taken back with the beauty of this area, couldn't imagine staying another winter in that environment up north and, and having to shovel and drive through all of that, never seeing any wildlife. Because here, just driving across from the airport to our beautiful Brevard County properties, you would get that feeling that you were back in time, that you were part of something a little bigger than all of us. And I thought that this would be a fantastic place to live, to work on projects and and a career that would uh, hopefully replicate the things that you had seen in National Geographic or I may have seen as a younger child growing up in northern Maine and um, being able to roam freely across a lot of different beautiful environments. And that was here, but it was tropical and the birds were huge. (laughs) They were really huge. Yes, and they have every, giant beaks too. Yes, they did. <laughs> yeah. Giant beaks. Giant, giant beaks. And long legs. And these were, these were birds that you would see once in a while in the New England environment. And because we used a lot of pesticides up there. Right. right. So here we are in this beautiful environment. And I said, this is the place to be. We're going to be not only replicating those types of things that you've seen in the magazines or on documentaries. You're going to be living it. You're going to have the opportunity to involve and you're going to have an opportunity to be a part of what's going on in the natural world here. And I took on that uh, responsibility maybe from meeting other like-minded people and 
going out bird watching and kayaking and and digging into the environment and really hiking out and camping out in this great great spot that was not as populated as it, as it is today sure has changed without yeah. a doubt and we saw that there was a big need at that time i think that was the beginnings of them starting to build the government complex down in Vieira. And we we're very interested in the burrowing owls that were there and getting photographs of them or sketching them or even being out to hear them and, and observe how they were living their lives. And knowing that this complex that was coming would most likely take away a lot of that opportunity for that particular species and others that were involved in the area. And we saw uh, that from the standpoint of the Sierra Club even had something they called a mock funeral. We walked down Wickham Road, which was a dirt road, right under 95 wow. at that time. There wasn't anything, no zoo or anything like that at that time, and it, or no hotels either. And uh, we carried a coffin, fake coffin, and put it out. And we even had a little jazz band. And we all put our nails into the coffin with our wishes for how we would preserve that land, what we could do. We made our commitments. And shortly after that, I had opportunity to work with people that were working on the Enchanted Forest conservation and preservation and was able to, to work in with that early group in the 89 time frame and really enjoy getting to know a scientific approach, the research that's needed, the classification, identification, and uh, cataloging of those environments so that we can take it forward and say, this is what an environmentally endangered land is. And we were successful with that. At that time, we had two programs, the Carl and Preserve uh, 2000, and Preservation 2000, rather, and the EEL program was in infancy that came along in its full-blown status in 1990 and that's when the properties were all purchased and started that being the flagship for the eel program it was a little under uh 330 acres at that time it just uh, a beautiful place that needed a lot of care yeah it did we we really are I, I i think we we don't think back about that being the hinge pen for the program and looking at what else we could do to grab the pieces that would fit together a corridor for the beauty that we know is here and that requirement for everyone to, to work together in the, the particular niches they have and respecting that. Can I say how amazingly inspiring I think it is to hear somebody that found something they were passionate about and angry about and made something beautiful come of it because so many of us just walk around mad all the time but what do we do about it nothing we do nothing we just complain and then we go on about our day yeah you, you all made something beautiful happen i think that rather than anger the the emotion and the 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 power that was going at that time was a really um, a deep-seated sacredness that we knew about the land some of us from a traditional standpoint others from a learned standpoint and, and many academic standpoints that really put the, the icing on the cake so that it was understood by the general population and our uh, political governments at that time, the ones that actually okayed that type of a, uh, creation of a program like the EEL program, Environmentally Endangered Lands. And from there it grew, and it, it just became a, a beautiful passion. And 33 and a third years later, I think it is, I've spent a lot of time in volunteering with a lot of the different sanctuaries and even had the dream job of my life after retiring 35 years at the Space Center, another beautiful area. We, we, we don't think about that being on the 175,000-acre Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, but their space and the environment try and work together. There, there are some. We, it's we yeah, there, know there's, some there's some complications there complications, for sure. And yet we we had Mike Knight on here, and we talked to, we talked to Mike about the Ill program and its benefits, and which you know which is I believe where me and you first met 
It was when you, I mean, you knew my family for a long time before that, but we first met when you were working over at Sam's house. Right. Yeah. Right. When we were doing, uh, you know, us through ears, which that was ears in the very beginning when we started doing our, uh, our biodiversity research in the different properties. So it was, uh, it was all kinds of cool stuff over there every day, it seemed like. Yeah, that, that eight years that I spent working as the educate. well, I started as a steward part-time and then moved up into the education coordinator position. So I think it was three years and five years split like that. But working with uh, Bill and Frank and their entire family and then a lot of the other students that we were involved with, we got our snake surveys done. We had our bio uh, blitz that was just amazing. We had, we had a uh, lot of we had a lot of fun. Over a there. lot of fun yeah. with that. A lot yeah. of a lot of cool research and a lot of fun, <laughs> no doubt about it. So we're at this point now where the county has is it seventy seven properties on the ill proper uh, the, on the, what the ill program has, or is it seventy two? It's there's se- seventy seven, right? There's a little over twenty six thousand acres, okay. and we have a, a little bit more than 72 miles of trails okay. and about 37 of those miles are on a, a budding property or, or a littoral space that would go into the Indian River Lagoon so they're super important because yeah. they're undisturbed and interfacing with the natural waterways. Right and people talk all the time you know just like you mentioned about the Maryland National Wildlife Refuge and the benefit it has to our community if we're being completely honest that kind of sits over to its own place. You know, the Maryland Refuge, is, it's, it's its own little animal out there by itself. These properties that are maintained and uh, preserved by the eel program are really what's holding our entire county together wildlife-wise. I mean, if without these properties here, there's nothing left. I mean, if, if we're being completely honest, there's, noth- there's no, there's no going to be any wildlife place, any wild places to go with your families and go uh, go see animals, see gopher tortoises, see scrub jays, uh, see pine snakes, see cool stuff that we have here. There's just there's no other opportunities for it. And there's a, a huge vote coming up, which you're part of through the Preserve Our Paradise group. Tell us about that, uh, what people need to do, where they can go to learn more. Tell, tell everybody what's going on. Absolutely. That's the important piece. We as citizens have voted to provide these programs and tax ourselves with an ad valorem tax and we've done it two prior times so we we have our second referendum will be sunsetting in 2024 and this year we have the referendum on the ballot so that we can reduce any risk of having a gap where the program isn't covered and again it's going to put into effect a 20-year plan and a program to put the environmentally endangered lands program under a management and education plan and keep it going. Uh, right now, I think within the program, there are 27 employees. Some of the hardest working people you could ever <laughs> possibly meet. I mean, there's there's uh, this inconsistency with uh, people believing government employees don't work hard. Oh, no. These guys, they bust their butts. I mean, between land managers uh the field technicians the people in the in the offices doing the work the education directors these are some of the hardest working people you could ever meet that are putting their blood sweat and tears uh into keeping these properties preserved and there for people to use and uh, i think it's important people know how drastically important this vote is this is something that needs to pass if it doesn't all this stuff goes away gets built on and there's no pla- there's no places left for wildlife it's just it's just gone and we we've seen that a lot of the properties they're a willing seller program so nobody's come in and taken land from anybody that it wasn't a a, a willing sale and that's the difficult part in getting that scientific study done to figure out which of those properties are going to be uh, viable for us to connect together and it's it's kind of cool because our county is built on this old Atlantic coastal ridge that comes all the way down from Jacksonville and goes all the way to Miami and of course it skirts along the Indian River Lagoon that was our communication line prior to 95 prior to US 1 prior to any technology we were able to navigate those waters with different types of boats we actually built a dugout at sam's house this is true you did we did we yeah. took a, a pine tree from one of the sam's family's properties that fell during 
I think Hurricane Matthew. It w- it was yeah. I and, remember I remember it. that's when I was over there. Yeah. It was yeah seventeen or eighteen. Yeah. And that that just gr- gave this fantastic opportunity for us to try ancient technologies to build it the way they would have that many years ago. And we know people were there because at the Sam's house there is a burial mound, and we know that Indian mound was conserved because it was a burial mound. We have evidence of human beings living all up and down and along the river, and we need to know more and more and more about who they were, why they were here, and how they survived, because we ourselves need to translate that technology for our futures. Yeah, in, in talking about that, okay, so that's, there's so many uh, layers to the importance of the eel program. You have the history there, mm-hmm. you have uh, the animals that are there that are uh, brutally important. I mean, really, nothing works without the background that they're, they're putting down. And then you have other research and things that people are working on and looking at, including some stuff you're involved with, looking at protected plants. I mean, there's uh, the Dicerander plant, there's uh, bromeliads, there's all kinds of cool stuff. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we've, we've done some really, really neat work with the different plant life and uh, figuring out how we can uh, conserve. We've, we've got a situation where in 1989, through the nursery trade, a very invasive weevil was brought in. And because we don't have enough ag investigators or inspections, this became a widespread problem to, through all South Florida. And by the 1990s, we had decimated at least 97% of the population of our native bromeliads, one being the Tillandsia utriculata. That's one that we can work with at the Enchanted Forest. And it's one that we used to relish going through some of the mesic hammocks and just looking up at the canopy structures of those oak trees and the the hickories and other trees that are there and the the mulberries and seeing these fantastically huge plants that looked something like bird nests (laughs) yeah and occluding the whole sky you would walk through that canopy and notice that you're you're having a temperature change you would walk through that canopy and notice that there was insect song there was reptile song we had tree frogs singing It was an amazing, amazing experience to walk through there. Within the time frame of this, uh, about 2006, we saw most of those giant plants falling to the ground. This weevil, unbeknownst to, I mean, it's not intended as a destructive life form, but it's not in its natural habitat. It lays eggs on the plant, and then the larval state eats out the stomata, the actual heart of that plant, and kills it. This is a plant that takes 20 years to grow to uh, reproductive state. Once it reproduces and seeds, it's dying. It's gone. So it's a very uh, a unique plant. It's now on the threatened and endangered listing for uh, plants within Florida. And we have them all throughout the enchanted forest, but in varying states of, of growth. The, the giant plants are gone. We uh, were very fortunate to bring in Dr. Howard Frank, Dr. Ron Cave, and Dr. Teresa Cooper Yawn. And Teresa stayed on to do a lot of her work out of University of Florida, and she had grants to study the insect. They're entomologists at heart, and we're looking at this life cycle. What can we do with this weevil? How do we stop it? How can we save this 3% of the population? And Uh, Many things were tried, and by uh, around the 2012 time frame, we were defunded. Um, Quarantine labs were shut down, and uh, the project became one that Teresa carried on her back and taught us what we could do. So we grabbed as as much information as we could by doing the the study of the baby plants and, and seeing their growth rates and that sort of thing, and then we went to the posture of just doing conservation. So now we have cages that we take the plants that are at maturity and put them in there so they're protected from the weevils. And grant funding for that was obtained through the Florida Native Plant Society conservation grants, uh, as well as some willing donors. 
We like willing donors. Willing sellers and willing donors are really awesome people. That helps a lot, yes. <laughs> we, we can't survive without them. So now it's a, a project of growing the plants to the size they do seed. And then every February and March, when they have the seed all ready to disperse, it's a windblown seed, a lot like a milkweed. It flies through the air. If you ever get to see one in the wild, it's an amazing thing because there are millions of seeds that are on the plant. And off they go with the breeze. So we use, uh, because these plants have been housebound in these cages, we use a leaf blower. And we blow those seeds up into the canopy of the trees and try and get them up at a height where they're going to have survivability factors. Cool. And That's so cool. It's fun. We, we make sure the cages are safe. We uh, go and find plants that have fallen onto the floor of the forest and rescue them if they're in a status to go to that uh, seeding stage and try and try and make sure that three percent doesn't go to two or one right we'd like to see a, a, another direction we'd like to see 80 yeah. 90 something like that within my time frame of, of my years that are left here are you all feeling hopeful that that's that's a possibility i think we're at a status quo right now um the last conference that we had was pre-pandemic at the Selby Gardens, and they're doing physical uh, seed studies there as well as conservation with another species, Guzmania, that was in the deep uh, Everglades, Big Cypress, and the Fakahatchee Strand. And those they're trying to uh, propagate and, and figure out more about the seeds. We have uh, sister projects at the Carlton Reserve. Uh, Tiger Bay had one going. Um, but since the pandemic, we haven't been able to gather and figure out what's going on. Dr. Frank attended the last one that we had and stated that it was that time frame that we look at the project a lot like we looked at what we did with the Florida panther. We brought in a species that was not the exact genetic form that lives here right. with the Texas panthers and crossbred them to increase the... the uh, Survival, survivability. survivability yeah. and the genetic pool. So with looking at genetics, there's a lot of other things can happen, and we really are hopeful that our youth who are in school now are supported enough, if it's a financial support through grants or if it's just the facility to look at the genetic structure of the plants and figure out what we can do to make them more viable against this weevil. Oh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't tell you we destroy weevils, too. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> That's got to feel very vindicating. There, I, yeah. I did have an adult. Gotcha. I think a week ago, we found an adult that was ready to merge, and they just go ahead and lay more eggs. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to say a little prayer about it because, oh. yeah. Yep. yeah, you have to do yeah, that. It's never, it's, you know, it's never a, it, a glorious thing in having to take something's life. No. Uh, I tell people that all the time. It, sometimes it's required. But it's not, there's nothing ever, uh, there's no warm, fuzzy feeling you get from having to take someone's life. No. And it should and never be celebrated by any means. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes it's the right thing and it needs to happen. Yeah. So I was looking through this, uh, this brochure you gave me here. And it's funny how, you know, what you were just talking about, you know, with, uh, with the bromeliads and everything else, it all, it all connects back to the old program. You know, it all, it all connects back. And, uh, yeah, we hit we hit on the the wildlife and the the birds and the fish and the different plants. Um, something people don't think about is you know the in fact that these properties being in your backyard, which if you live on an ill property, you should be the biggest fan of them in the possible the possible world because there's nobody living behind you. Your property <laughs> values are going up. Uh, it, it's increasing tourism dollars. It makes sense. Attracting new businesses. Uh, it's preserving the the shorelines of the Indian River and the St. Johns. Um, it's more places for you to go. It's more things for you to learn. There's, there's so many positive things here. Uh, people need to, need to be thinking about and, and reading literally this is costing each homeowner $3, a, $3 a month. Think about that over the course of a year, mm -hmm. you're paying at what? 30 bucks, you know, 30, 35 bucks. Come on now. This is uh, this is the easiest choice you ever made. Vote, vote yes for it. It's uh, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, the website where you can go find out what's going on and find out more about it is preserveourparadise.com. That's a, an easy win, guys. Um, I, I don't think anything else really needs to be said about that. Uh, I Every time I get the opportunity, I speak up on behalf of the EEL program because I'm literally out there every day. 
I've shed my blood out there. I've shed plenty of sweat uh, and a few tears probably along the way too. It's it's a part of my my daily life. Sometimes more than uh, a lot of other people, and I love it. It's a it's a these properties are a place where you can get away from everything else for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. And in Brevard County, there's not any of those places left. That's it. It's the old program. There's nothing left. Without those properties, we don't have those spots. But anyhow, I digress. Um, we also wanted to touch on a festival you have coming up called the Native Rhythms Festival, which is uh, November 11th through 13th at Wickham Park. This, how many years in a row have you done this? This will be our 14th year. 14, wow. 14 years. During pandemic, we, we stayed true to doing a, a program. We did a virtual program. We thought it was going to be a little three-hour something we'd throw on YouTube. It turned out to be two full <laughs> eight-hour days. Wow. Yeah, and it's still out there. You can go and see that anytime you're housebound and can't get out and need a little encouragement. Yeah, so but quickly give us a give us a breakdown of how how this got started, what it's all about, uh, the purpose of it and uh, yeah, just all the all the general the general details. Well, this started after we had done a powwow in Melbourne at the uh, B, what was then BCC campus and we did that one for I believe 9 years. Okay. And nine years previous to this previous yeah Holy moly. so the organizations wow. so we're talking about 23 years right now okay right and as everything happens things age out people leave yeah. unfortunately yep. <laughs> and, and it's hard to replace people when when you're doing things but we were very fortunate to merge in with a lot of fantastic musicians that love the native american flute and there's a lot of them here in Brevard county who make them and uh, play them and have flute circles and we had a meeting and and decided it would be neat to meld the music and nature and the out of doors together and going over to the amphitheater that has its origins on another project that I worked on when I was at Space Center because our boss was a a Vietnam veteran and they had their reunions there those veterans built that amphitheater which is really cool um, so that has history all the way back. I don't even know how many years they've done that, but we're we're there to do this in honor of Native American Heritage Month. Okay. And we bring in entertainers from across the country. We have people who have that type of of uh, notoriety and and talent that they're awarded. Uh, Shelley Morning Song, who's one of our Flute players and singers has won the Artist of the Year in 2019, and she also won uh, Best Blues Recording for the Native American Music Awards. It's equivalent of Grammys, and we've had Grammy Award winners before. We've had Robert wow. Mirabal a couple of times, and he's uh, he's been awarded. We have many people that have been nominated. Uh, so we we look for those people who are in the field of music and in the culture of the music for Native American Heritage Month to come up on the stage and interact with the people. It's family friendly, free of admissions. That's one of the things that we really drove our mission to say everybody and anybody can come to this. You do not have to have a a beautiful thing. Pocket full of gold to get in the door. We ask you to bring your beautiful spirits and your ears and your hearts and really enjoy it. And if you've got money that you're um, looking to spend, we'll have a whole vendor village and some really (laughs) fantastic food and just great time for everybody. It's a a wonderful weekend. I I think that we put a lot of, and you're going to find this after your event, that they're going to ask you, what are your metrics? How do you know the people liked it? Did you take a survey? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even thought about that part of it yet. Oh, my garage. The thing yeah. that will give you more knowledge about the crowd is their faces as they're mm-hmm. leaving. They're going back to their car, and there's a big smile on their face. You know you've done your job. And, and speaking of that, you know, I know when we were originally planning ours, I spoke to you about it a few times, and you gave me some great advice um, and some really good ideas, and I appreciate that. Because, uh, again, you've been doing this for a very long time, and I could think yeah. of nobody better to pick 
to pick their mind than you. Because we were talking about this before we started the podcast. <laughs> I love surrounding myself with people that know more about things than I do. Like I have, we all have our own little, our own little thing we're good at or know something about. Man, throughout life, it just, it's so great to surround yourself with people that know more about mm-hmm. other topics outside your area of expertise. So you can go, hey, by the way, I'm an idiot when it comes to this. Can you please give me some advice? Can I absorb a little bit of what you got, please? It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So thank you. You're very welcome. It's from the heart. Yep. It is. I forgot to tell you about our logo this year. Yeah. We're using the red wolf. This is a species Pretty that's awesome. extirpated from the state of Florida. It was here widely. I believe even when I came in, there was a group that was trying to do a preservation of the very last wolves that were in the northern part of the state. Jerry Lindner and her family. And I was uh, just amazed that this animal had no place to live. Now there are six breeding pair left in the world in wow. North Carolina. They are, that's it. We're good at doing stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I mean, we're, we're good at doing yeah. stuff like that. People are always talking about wanting to travel to the moon and Mars and stuff. I'm like, why can't we fix what we have first? You so, know, but. <laughs> we're honoring Red Wolf this year and uh, very happy to have that as a yeah. logo. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Okay, so we got a little bit of trivia. You want to do some trivia with us? Yes. Okay, so, all right, let's get into this. So this <laughs> is uh, Native American or Indigenous people trivia. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what we know. I, you know, I'm trying to think <laughs> if I would have known any of this or not. I don't. I like. I don't know. Uh, number one, you mentally prepared for this, Bill? Yes, okay. I am prepared. <laughs> 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 number one, what is the city in the United States with the largest Native American population? I think it's New York, but I'm not positive. What do you think, Bill? Cindy? I have maybe, no idea. Maybe it's I Tucson. I would say Minneapolis. That's a good guess. That's actually a really good guess. But it's, uh, Martha but it's had wrong. it right. It's New York City. <laughs> really? Yes. Min- I would have probably went with Minneap- Minneapolis mm-hmm. as well. That's, uh, it's, it, mm-hmm. it, when it, I, was I understand in, it. When I was in Minnesota a couple summers ago, lots of, um, uh, of, of native, um, nation license plates really oh yeah because my daughter was oh. doing the license plate game and <laughs> uh, and so yeah we ran across a lot of uh of native american um tribal license plates interesting okay well you, you knocked that one of the park martha <laughs> number two many historians believe that the united states constitution was partially modeled after the great law of peace the constitution of what native american group this one was in our history books when we were kids. Yeah. I, would, I would say the Cherokee. Yeah, I, I would say Iroquois. I would agree with her. It is the Iroquois. <laughs> Iroquois. Yeah, it is the Iroquois. <laughs> wow. Good job. Two for two. All right. Number three in our last one. Here we go. The red dye used to dye the red British uniforms in the American Revolution, and it was a, a dye that was like super highly valued, was made by Native Americans from what? Well, you could use the the uh, the little dealies. There's some little insects that are are cactus, prickly pear cactus. She got it, didn't she? She knocked it out of the park again. Yes, you're 100 percent right. I know that. What what is it called? Do you know what it's called? I don't know what it's called. Begins with a C. Yeah, it's it's a it's a weird name. I don't I don't think I could even pronounce it if I saw it wrote down somewhere. Oh, I wish. I, I think it's C A G something. I wish I was a wise guy because I just. <laughs> You knew that, and you're, you are wise. <laughs> oh, They're fun. Wow. If you see that white fuzzy stuff on the prickly pear, and pull it off and then squish it, and your your fingers will turn all red. It's cool. What? Yeah, yeah I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, I, I dare to say that was something else we probably learned at some point somewhere, but I don't. I, I, I want to say it was something I'm sure I read at some Next point. Next time we're emptying snake cages, I'll try and find it. Okay. Is it seriously in there? <laughs> are you messing with me? No, it's, that's how you find it. It's this little, it, there's a little white fuzzy stuff that grows on because they make a little cocoon around themselves. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah. And then if you just pull that off and, and squish it, you'll turn right. You can make little dolly cheeks. <laughs> okay, so when you guys see a you'll picture see of me Frank here in the near future. You'll see Frank out there doing that now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be, look, I'm gonna be 100% looking <laughs> yeah. for this stuff at this point. Uh, Martha, thank you so I'm much for joining us. Get my phone and so, look it up. <laughs> you, again, if you want to learn more about the uh, Preserve Our Paradise uh, vote that's coming up, 
it's a vote on November the 8th. We're going to air this. Uh, we'll air this one next week. Um, make sure this gets up there for everybody in plenty of time. It's uh, preserveourparadise.com. Um, again, vitally important. You guys 100% need need to, if you're even confused a little bit about what the EEL program is or what it's all about, go read about it. Uh, it's a quick Google, E-E-L-S, EELS program. Um, yeah, it's... It, it should be the easiest three bucks a month you ever spent, and you're not even spending because it's already go, it's something that you're already doing anyhow. Right. You know, it's you, you don't even yeah. know it's there because you're already doing it. Yeah. And most people that are paying for it weren't here when it was started anyhow. So that's the 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 gist of it now is to make everyone aware of how those lands are cared for. Right. So we have a lot of new residents that have never been to any of the properties. Yeah, I've talked to people yeah. uh, sometimes that uh, don't know about them, and once they find out about them, they're hooked. I mean, they're just 100% hooked. I'm like, this is here for your yeah. benefit to go use. Go use them all you want to. Use them all the time. Walk on them. Take your families out. Enjoy them. But anyhow, I digress. Um, again, Martha, thank you so much for joining thank us today. You. We really appreciate you being here. Bill, Cindy, until next week. Yeah? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe I'll see you guys next week. Maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Get the vote out. Yep. Thank you guys for joining <laughs> us. Uh, we will see you all next week. Uh, again, we have an event coming up November the 19th at Sandpoint Park. First, before you go to that one, go to Native Rhythms Festival. It's November 11th to 13th at Wickham Park. Go there, and then the next weekend, come up and hang out with us at Sandpoint Park. Hope to see you all there. We'll catch you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. (laughs) We did it.